Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be. I know we are at different uh, time, uh, time zones. Uh, indeed, my name is Idris Munir Al Ali. I'm the acting director of the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism. Super excited today to moderate this session uh, on youth gender responsiveness approaches to community policing. Uh, the objective of today's session uh, are to uh, consider strategic approaches to engaging effectively with youth in preventing and countering violent extremism uh, contexts that involve community policing and related approaches by security actors. The session also aims to examine cases of promising youth engagement initiatives in community policing and preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, it also aims to understand the gender implications, so that gender dimension in, in the uh, programs that we may have on PCVE and community approaches to it, and consider the special potential and value added that women uh, and youth can bring to community policies in practice. As you can see, the objectives of today's sessions are quite complementary to uh, the ones from uh, last week, you know, session three on uh, national local engagement uh, in CVE, which considered where community trust building fits into national plans to prevent and uh, combat violent or counter violent extremism. Uh, last week's session also examined cases of African countries that have incorporated local actors into the community policing programs uh, to prevent and counter violent extremism. It also discussed different models of national, uh, of national local division of labor between security actors uh, and, what is, and what it means for, uh, you know, the stakeholders uh, within the community. While the group discussions, um, you know, from last week's Wednesday, uh, allowed space to discuss and share individual uh, member states' experiences uh, when it comes to uh, uh, local uh, community engagement. Uh, the sessions really focused on uh, the promising approaches and lessons learned that address specific challenges to national, national local uh, cooperation. Uh, it also discussed in a frank and very open way uh, the obstacles that local authorities face in engaging in preventing and countering violent extremism. And then also the ultimate question that came uh, again was what happens when national local security actors do not work well with each other? So the complication that, uh, that comes out of not working with each other, compounding uh, you know, the efforts at, at local levels. And then what range of local authorities and local perspectives on violent extremist threats and community policing approaches uh, need to be taken into account to maximize the uh, effectiveness of intervention. So as, as you can see, you know, today's session is quite you know, digging even deeper. You know, in, instead of looking at the wider community engagement, we're specifically looking now and drilling down to uh, you know um, the specific actors, so the role of youth, the role of women, and how they can be uh, proactive or role uh, active uh, members in the uh, development, but also the implementation of PCVE programs, in particular those linked to community policing. Uh, as for today's sessions, I'm really blessed to have two very capable speakers that will share with you their experiences on today's topic of again youth and gender responsiveness, or responsive approaches, excuse me, to community policing and CVE. We have my, let's just say, partner in crime because we are the TAC team in group three, uh, my co-facilitator co of group three, Ms. Kimi Okiando, executive director partners, uh, West Africa, Nigeria, rule of law empowerment. Uh, she has over 10 years experience in security and governance issues with both in both Nigeria and West Africa. She has also over seven years experience in NGO management and three years experience in litigation practices. She has expertise in the security governance sector with special emphasis uh, on police accountability and citizen security institutions engagement. She has also been engaged in several works geared towards the evolution of non-state actors and their contribution to improving public safety and security, policing and gender issues, as well as election security management. She is also well experienced in project management, monitoring and evaluation, fundraising, stakeholder management and networking, as well as team building and innovative leadership. 
I must add to your experience, you had to, you know, at least three sessions to put up with me as co-facilitator in group three. So that one needs to be, you know, highlighted in your bio. Uh, we also have Mr. Abdul Qasim Fomba. Uh, he is the national coordinator of leading, a leading think tank and action group in Mali called Think Peace, which focuses on issues of security, conflict management and prevention of violent extremism. He is a researcher with several major contributions and publications on the trajectory of youth in armed groups in Mali and Burkina Faso, the perception of local populations on peace building. Mr. Fomba has participated and facilitated numerous conferences on youth conflict and extremist violence at the national and international levels. Uh, as national coordinator of Think Peace, he has set up specialized networks to raise awareness among communities on issues of security, conflict management, and the prevention of violent extremism. He led the creation of the mixed teams for peaceful environment in several commu uh, communes of Mali as actors of alert and responses to the community uh, conflict. Mr. Famba is currently a member of the National Strategic Committee for the Prevention and, Com and Countering Violent Extremism and Terrorism in Mali. Uh, he is also a member of the National Strategy Committee for the Prevention and Countering Violent Extremism and Terrorism in Mali. So you see, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we have a wealth of experience uh, around today's discussion. And I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to really uh, be able to facilitate this session with two very capable um, experts that will bring, you know, expertise uh, and concrete uh, examples uh, of, 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 of the issues that we are uh, discussing, but we also have at hand. So without further ado, uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Abdul Qasim, uh, you know, given the, the experience and given the, you know, uh, the, uh, the engagement that you have and the role you're playing in Mali. Uh, you know, yesterday I attended a meeting on Mali, so it is really high on the agenda. And I would wish for you to, you know, to start first. So my first question would be, what should engagement between law enforcement and youth uh, take place in preventing violent extremism and countering violent extremism initiatives that involve community policing. So over to you, Abdul Qasim. Uh, um, I'm giving you five minutes each, uh, you know, uh, for the questions that uh, I'm asking, you know, to allow space uh, and time for uh, the, uh, the, the audience and the participants to be able to interact and ask questions and maybe engage and, and share with us their own perspective and experiences. So Abdul Qasim, over to you, my brother. Abdul Qasim, do we still have him? Uh, you are unmuted, uh, so if you can unmute yourself, please. Voilà. Très bien. À vous, mon frère. Oui, allô? Yes, bien, hello, vous... can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, great. Go ahead. Wonderful, thank you. I would like to thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to present our experiences and what we're doing in the, on the ground and to share some ex experiences that have been very important for us. Before I begin talking about the subject at hand today, I would like to explain some of the context. This is going to be based on the activities that our think tank called Think Peace has been un undertaking in Mali. And I'd like to also share some of our perceptions, the perceptions of the young people. We have been uh, undertaking some surveys out in the field, uh, interviewing young people. And we've been doing that recently. We've been going to youth centers uh, early November to ask them questions, to see what their perceptions are and whether or not they've changed. So we wanted to have the specific reaction from young people, what they think, what their attitudes are, and We've been looking at it in the central part of Mali, the southern part of Mali, and in my, as I uh, present my uh, my comments and during my uh, the question answer, I can answer any questions about that, some of the specificities, and this is also linked to some of the different conflicts that we're seeing in various zones and what the youth perception is. In Mali, 
there are some areas where we have the security and defense forces and in the central part of Mali, for example, the defense forces play the same role as the security forces. So sometimes for the local communities, it is difficult for them to distinguish between these two different groups of security forces, security forces or defense forces, because they're both playing the role, same role interchangeably. So it's important to note that a majority of young people think that we are going to solve the issue of violent extremism through a military response. That's usually what they think. And this approach has marginalized several communities that feel as though they're being persecuted. And so because of these because of the fact that these communities have been felt marginalized, we have been working to find a more community-based appro uh, uh, approach. And we are trying to see that, find solutions that, are be, that will be acceptable to all sides. And as you know, normally the government would be responsible for providing services and, and, ass and assistance to these communities to help fight violent extremism. But sometimes in these communities, they're not getting the support that they, that they need. And so in the current context of COVID-19, they are not always being uh, supplied with the assistance and the supplies that they need. And the affected communities are also then feeling, in addition, the economic uh, effects of COVID-19. In Mali, we have uh, youth who, are, who have been recruited for some of these violent groups. And, and then other we, in other cases, we also have youth who have been working with the security and defense forces. So it's extremely important for us to maintain and sustain a good relationship between the defense forces, the security forces, and the youth. And this collaboration will allow us to make sure that the youth understand the uh, role of the security and defense forces better, that they can also be able to work with other members of the community that there is information that is provided to the community about the activities that will be conducted by these forces. In some communities, for example, different actors come in, and it's what we call in Mali uh, groups, uh, sort of an outside group, a visiting group. And with this system, this allows other actors to come in and start operating, and sometimes it's not always clear what their role is. And so we need to be able to get better information out. Youth also need to be able to understand what the potential risks are with uh, conflicts or violent extremism. And in some areas right now, especially in the central part of Mali, we see that youth have been uh, forming small groups. But every time there is a potential risk uh, of conflict, or extremism, then we can see that these youth can easily be recruited for these activities. So we also need to be able to better triangulate the information and get the information out. We have met several times with uh, security forces on the ground, and every time we have spoken with them about what the general sentiment is in the community, amongst the population, And we have also seen that they've come back to tell us that several times we have seen issues where there has not been good collaboration between the youth and the uh, security forces, but in other cases there has been better collaboration. And so th this primarily rests on youth getting information and understanding the situation in the villages. So we need to be able to get the information out so that we can, they can also better understand what is happening on the ground, have a better understanding and be able to react uh, in accordance with 
the information because often, unfortunately, there is a lack of coordination. And unfortunately, there have been some in, there have been some cases where there has been an incident and it's taken a great deal of time for the army to be able to be deployed or security forces to arrive on the scene and people in the meantime have been killed or there have been massacres. And so this is uh, an important aspect, uh, making sure that everybody's aware of what's going on and that the information gets out. Uh, certainly, thank you very much, Abdul Hassim. For I, I will follow up with uh, with some question at a later stage. But net, uh, you know, just for comparison's sake, let me just uh, you know revert back to Kimi and ask her the same question, but from the you know the the women's role perspective. So why should engagement between law enforcement and women take place in PCVE initiatives that involve community policing? So Kimi, given you know your background and your experiences. If, if you can tell us a bit about this and, you know, explain to us why it is important uh, to, to engage uh, women in, uh, in, in such uh, uh, programs, please. Thank you, Idris. Um, similar context the, with what um, Fumba has um, described. Um, for us here, the um, insurgency in the Northeast, and I think the pockets of conflicts across the country brings to the forefront again, the need for police or security, law enforcement security engagement um, with citizens. And um, <clears throat> because of the architecture of the law enforcement and security agencies, what we have is that you have a regime, you have a, a security architecture that is regime focused and not really focused at engagement with, um, with its citizens. Um, and as we move from a uh, legacy, military legacy into a democracy, you find that citizens' engagement should be at the heart of engagement for any serious-minded law enforcement and security organization. And women form part of that, of the, of the cluster of citizens that need to be um, engaged. Um, <clears throat> Over here, you also, have a, you also have a scenario that women are more than half of the population. So you're having a situation whereby you have them within the security and law enforcement agency, you have them within the community, but they are within both institutions, they're engaging in a highly patriarchal society. So if you do not create the space and an enable environment for them to engage, you are losing um, essential information you are losing contact with an essential population that you ought to be engaging with. And they bring to bear certain skill sets that, you know, <clears throat> maybe you might not get elsewhere. For example, early warning. Early warning um, systems and mediation is one, it, it are two areas that you find that women play a critical role. So in being able to alert when there are issues that have been identified, either within their private space, within their micro space, either at the community level where they are trading, where they are doing business, within their, within their private space, within their homes, or at a larger community level, what they see and what they hear, you know. But if that engagement space is not there, you lose that vital information. On the side of the security agencies, there's a rule of thumb that says the law enforcement and security agencies must mirror the society they want to engage with. So how do you engage with, how do you expect women to engage with the security and law enforcement agency that is predominantly male dominated? So when there are issues that are peculiar to them, or that are a bit um, <clears throat> sensitive. So for example, sexual gender-based violence, who do they report to? Do they report to male officers or they'll feel more comfortable reporting to female officers? You know? So you see this dynamic and I'll end by saying that even within the, even within the cluster of non-state security actors, we also still struggle with this, um, with finding space for women. So, it wasn't um, when CJTF started in the Northeast, CJTF was predominantly male driven. But over time, they needed to have a female wing. And you saw, we saw the female wing of the CJTF evolve. 
Why? Because on the other hand, you've had a scenario where the insurgent groups were now using women as active participants. So they were carriers, they were couriers, you know, and you're working in an environment that is predominantly um, uh, Sharia dominated, which means male officers could not check um, female um, citizens. So you needed to have women to be able to conduct the stop and search on other women, you know. So you saw that natural evolution on the side of the security and law enforcement um, uh, agencies. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kimi. And I'm sure, you know, later on we can have some more examples of how, you know, both women and youth can be engaged, you know, some kind, you know, uh, some examples of initiatives whereby, you know, uh, both, uh, both of these major and important stakeholders uh, can be engaged in community policing. Uh, so, Abdul Qasim, uh, again, I'm reverting back to you. I know based on your experience working in Mali, uh, what specific grievances or questions might youth have about law enforcement uh, actors uh, involvement in their communities uh, that would affect and how they choose to buy into community policing programs uh, aimed at preventing and countering violent extremism? So the question is two. You know, one of them, uh, you know, the first question is the grievances and questions that the youth might have about law enforcement actors involved in their communities and that, that would affect them and how uh, the, those actors as youth uh, would choose to buy into community policing programs aimed at PCVE. So over to you, uh, Abdul Khasi. Uh, mute, unmute. Okay. Voilà. Um, Tout à fait. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, there's one point that I think is extremely important, and that is that right now the security forces that are supposed to be providing security for people and goods are working in sort of total contradiction with the youth. If you look at the three sectors that are the north, center, and south of Mali, in all these areas, the communities are unanimous, not always for the same reason, but they unanimously have a lack of trust with vis-a-vis -vis the security forces. So lack of trust between security and defense forces and the youth. And the defense and security forces uh, therefore are not trusted by the majority of people and principally by the young. So we need to be able to strengthen these ties. We need to have a greater sense of trust between the forces and the youth. And this is something that we are seeing generally across the country in all areas. So first of all, as I said, there's a lack of trust. But the first reason for this lack of trust is that sometimes there's a fear that you might be perceived as a collaborator within the community if you are working with the security forces. As I was saying earlier, some members of the community are sometimes annexed into these security forces when there's an intervention or a military intervention in the field. They sometimes recruit the young people, but then they are afraid of being uh, seen as a conspirator. Then second reason for this mistrust is that when the young people are taken as um, or recruit as recruits to work with the security and defense forces, there could be revenge taken out against them by members of the community or revenge against members of their family. So that's a second reason. And then the third, the third point, and of course you can't generalize, for some people, people often have a hard time uh, understanding whether it's somebody who is a terrorist, uh, whether it's an extremist. And so it's sometimes there's a bit of a confusion amongst who the different actors are. And this is accentuated, especially in the central part of Mali. And we see this uh, in all areas of, of, of Mali. But as I was saying, there are some uh, areas where the defense forces are playing the role of the police or the security forces. So there's a lack of trust. And we have, uh, in, we have put into place certain activities to try to bolster this trust. We've had weekly fairs, as we call them, 
uh, to try to promote outreach and information. And in many zones, as I was saying, where we don't have a police presence, the military is playing this role. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of distrust with these forces. And as I was saying earlier, we can't generalize and say that all the forces are like this, that they are involved in racketeering or in uh, annexing these youth to be part of the forces, but these are prob this is problematic in some zones. Also, there is sometimes collaboration between armed gangs and security forces. And this is something that the community see, perceives typically, and they will see that unfortunately, the security forces may actually be collaborating with these gangs or armed criminal groups. And if they were to give information or be an informant with the police, then sometimes they may be the subject of, of uh, revenge after, or they may be targeted or attacked because of this information that they've given. So they've learned their lesson that there is some sort of collaboration between the, uh, the police or the security forces and some of these armed, these local criminal groups. And then sometimes when you look at some of the uh, extremist violent groups that are operating out in the field, they sometimes try to uh, obtain information from young people or recruit them, but we see that sometimes they will pose as uh, small merchants, people who are out selling peanuts or other uh, items, but they are actually posing and they are really members of these groups, these uh, violent groups. And so this can also uh, add to the confusion that the population has because uh, it's not always clear whether it's somebody who's a member of the community or a member of one of these violent groups. There's also the uh, fear of being uh, falling victim to an ambush. Uh, as I said, there are sometimes uh, interventions uh, out in the field and people sometimes get caught in the crossfire and this has cost uh, many lives, unfortunately. The final point that I think is a, a somewhat interesting point, but it is a reality, and that is that you see it in the region of uh, Segu in the middle part of Mali. You see that some young people are very angry when they see that sometimes the security forces are actually out trying to uh, take away their girlfriends or their fiancés or their or trying to trying to steal them away so to speak because they have more resources or they have more money and so they're trying to lure them away and this makes a lot of people a lot of young people very angry also because they see that the security forces are abusing their power so to speak or their position and this also adds uh, this is another phenomenon that um, that we see the fact that these youth are angry because um, you know sometimes these police people these police officers are going after their girlfriends or their fiancés so the, those are a few points that i wanted to raise uh, the fact that there is a lack of security forces in many local communities in mali and this is problematic because when there isn't a police presence or uh, security forces then groups come in to occupy this space and these are, could be local groups. They could be young people who create their own civil defense groups to defend their community. Or you see other groups that come in to propose security services for the community. And they may be uh, paid different ways. They could be paid through sort of a taxing system or because they uh, impose taxes on the local community to provide these security ser services. And then we see cases where there may be militias who come in to these zones, and they often try to recruit youth from the village. So as a result, the community members in these villages find it 
difficult to uh, to fight these militia groups because members of their own community have been integrated into the militia or recruited into a, into the group. Another important point is the relationship between security and defense forces. And by relationship, I mean the, the sentiment, the perception. And I can give you some of the actual words that people gave us when they were describing this. They used words such as uh, the uh, relationship has, has, has crumbled, it's, it's uh, extremely bad, the relationship has been completely destroyed. So they're using quite powerful words, negative language to really convey the fact that there is a poor relationship between security forces and the youth. And it's extremely important that we have better relationships and we need to be able to nourish these relationships within the community so that the community members are not going to be suspicious of security forces, but they'll see them more as partners. Sometimes people who have been victims of uh, abuses of, of power or other issues related to the security forces, they uh, feel that they don't have a recourse, they don't have a way, a way to express uh, their, their concerns. So we need to find ways for them to be able to uh, provide this forum for them to express their concerns. And then we also have to look at issues where sometimes it may be a, a minor incident or if you look at the environment in some sectors, you see that there's sort of also this uh, attitude where the security forces expect you to treat them very formally to use the formal you in french and to uh, and, and so it's as though they are speaking down to the to the population or treating them as inferior and then so we also see that in some cases where communities are not receiving security forces then they also have a very uh, poor uh, perception of the uh, security forces. And this, I'm just going to give you one more minute because you've, you've gone past your five minutes. I have to thank you about the sharing, but please, if you can wrap up in one minute. <laughs> if you could just wrap up in one minute. Yes, sorry. Maybe when we get to the question and, and uh, Q&A, I can give some more details perhaps so that I don't keep uh, going over my time now. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, we appreciate very much everything you're sharing with us. I have to say that, you know, you're, you're coming with a wealth of field experience, uh, you know, through uh, Think uh, Peace in Mali, where you're in intervening in nine out of the 10 zones. And you know what you're sharing with us is part of a questionnaire that you circulated within the youth community. So it's, it's quite valuable, but um, you know, being uh, very cautious of, of time, I, I, I would wish then you know, the participants to come and ask you some more specific questions uh, to, to share with us. So Kimi, uh, coming back to you, uh, what are some of, um, let's just say what are some, or let's just say the major barriers that hamper the active uh, and effective participation of women in community community policing and PCVE, in the context of PCVE. Over to you. I'll say patriarchy. Basically, patriarchy is the big elephant in the room. Um, and you see the, uh, should I say, the ugly face of patriarchy um, uh, playing out in religion, playing out with culture, playing out with regulations and um, the legislative framework of the security and law enforcement um, agencies. And um, I guess because we, uh, because we know that that's the big elephant in the room, that's the reason you have the UN Resolution 1325 that is basically creating space for women. And that's why you also have the 2242 and you have the Maputo Protocol, you know, basically trying to create space for us um, to engage so when we see patriarchy, if we take it as patriarchy, then we look at it within the security um, representation within the security agencies. So you have a scenario where if I use the Nigerian police force as an example, 
I think the women population in the police, if I'm not mistaken, to be is about 12.4 percent. That is less than 20 percent in a police organization that is supposed to be over 300 thousand. And when you drill it a bit further, you find presently, I don't think we have a female deputy inspector general of police presently. We do not, I think maybe we have one AIG um, and then maybe two CPs. So that tells you within the management team, you know, there is no representation of women within the management um, team. Um, I'd said earlier how we saw the evolution of women participation in some of the security agencies, the military, for example, because it was seen as a, uh, it, it was seen more as a response to the activities of the insurgent um, groups. Um, then we look at, you know, when people talk about um, countering or preventing violent extremism, because the militarized approach is put above the soft approach, you also miss out the engagement of women, right? So the militarized approach is the military response to it. But if you're looking at the root causes, then the soft approach would be something that one would look at. And if you're looking at the soft approach, it would create more um, spaces for women to engage. So the response of the state to preventing or countering violent extremism also is a challenge or a barrier to women participating in community policing in preventing violence, um, preventing or countering violent extremism. Then there's all these technicalities that we love to talk about, all the technical jargons. So when we're talking about, when we raise technical issues, there is a greater tendency for women to feel that they are not properly equipped to engage within this space. Right, because of course we know the level of education for women is um, a bit low compared to the men. Because if you look at the um, indicators for girl child education, if you look at the rate at which the young girls drop out of school at the age of puberty, so I mean, it's just like a system that doesn't really work in our favor. Then, when you talk of funding again, um, some people would say funding hampers women from engaging. I'm not of that, maybe within the formal agency. But if you look, there are case studies of the informal sector where you've had a scenario that where women have contributed their token to and to, um, to um, supporting non-state actors for them to be able to do their work effectively. So if you're looking at funding at the higher level, it would, I can say, yes, it closes the, you know, it closes us out. But if you look at funding at the lower level, it kind of creates space for us to be able to engage. But then you find that when we do put the little monies we have together to create the space for engagement, we do not really understand what we're doing, right? So we put it together, we put the mineral resources we have together, the, our limited resources together, and hand it over to the men to um, basically um, dole out or determine how it's gonna be um, spent. So um, patriarchy, patriarchy, patriarchy and patriarchy showing its face in different um, ways. Finally, I'll look at it through the legal framework, right? So the legal framework as a tease for most of the agencies do not create that space. And why do I say that? I don't think we have um, legal, um, security and uh, law enforcement or security agencies that have a quota for women for recruitment, right? So most times the gender policy, now in recent times, gender policies are being developed and P1 is helping some of them with their gender policies. But when we're talking gender policy for them, they are looking at the service at the end of the chain, which is response to sexual gender-based violence. They're not looking at it from the lens of recruitment. Is there a quota for women for recruitment of women into these agencies? What is the training schedule looking like? What is the, what is the policy for retainment and 
posting and promotions, you know, it's not seen through the entire spec, um, um, spare. So that's, uh, I'll, I'll say those are all, these are some of the barriers that we have for women effectively participating in preventing and countering violent extremism. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Kimi. Uh, this is quite helpful. And I think we can all relate to uh, what both of you and Abdul Qasim uh, were saying as being the major challenges and barriers in engaging uh, both, uh, both of these uh, important stakeholders. Abdul Karim, let me come back to you. Abdul, um, Abdul Qasim, sorry, I don't know why I'm calling you Abdul Karim. <laughs> but Abdul Qasim, apologies. Uh, let me come back to you with uh, my last question to you. How can the effectiveness of law enforcement engagement with youth be increased? So what can be done uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, the engagement is increased, increased in, in PCVE? Uh, in particular, uh, within the context of community policing. So over to you, Abdul Qasim, please. Well, uh, thank you, thank you. How can we have better in engagement? I think that if you look at the complexity of these interventions, I think the first way to have better engagement with youth is to actually involve them in the response and in the approaches. It's not sufficient. And I think that this is perhaps a rule that applies to everybody working in the field. It's not sufficient to, It, it, it's not, it would, it, would, it would be like as though you were preparing a dish at your house and then you're expecting everybody else to prepare it the same way or to taste it the same way. In other words, we have to have them involved in the process. And the idea is to see how they interpret the situation and the concepts. Do they understand if, and, and the situation and are these approaches, are these strategies actually responding to the needs in the community? So there has to be, uh, there has to be more connection with the young people. They have to be involved in these projects or approaches, and so they can say, uh, for example, in some communities there isn't an internet connection, so they don't have access to the information. So that's one starting point: getting more, inter getting them more involved, more connected, and then in involving these young people. We need to also ask their opinion. What do they think is the solution, or what can be? What do they feel could be part of the the approach or the or the strategy? If they are proposing solutions as well, and then we can look at them together. We can all see how we can refine or adapt these solutions. Then they're going to take ownership, and necessarily, I think that when we have intervention programs, they're going to feel as though they have more ownership, and they're going to continue collaborating and working with the process. So we also have to focus on the issue of funding of resources because we're in talking about communities, societies where they don't have economic possibilities. And if we uh, are, if we uh, focus too much on, uh, on on the responses without looking at the funding and how they can be funded, then that's not going to be efficient either. So we have to look at how we can implement these strategies, but also more importantly, how that can be funded. And then this is related to the first point. It has to be a participatory approach, an inclusive approach uh, between the youth and the security forces. We talk about this a lot, but in this case, it's extremely important in this context. And can talk about some of the experiences we've had in the field. I remember that in several different communities, uh, particularly Panamba, which is in the southern part of Mali. And then we also had this situation in another uh, village as well, where the defense forces, the security forces, or the law enforcement forces, and the young people were brought together in the same room. And this was actually somewhat exceptional it, because this was the first time, uh, some youth told me that this was the first time they had ever found themselves in the same room or in the same area, same place with security forces. Because 
in, in, in a peaceful atmosphere because otherwise normally in the past when they ever when they were ever standing before a police officer it was usually in some sort of a confrontational situation so this was the first time they had come together and that was extraordinary for them and it really opened their eyes because they said well look you can answer or ask us any questions you want there won't be any rep reprisals no uh, negative reaction you can just ask us questions and they were very surprised the youth to see that they could be open and, and discuss with the police uh, forces so that's uh, one positive example and then in addition to these participatory uh, approaches we also have been trying to implement joint activities and this can be through sporting events or cultural events uh, environmental activities, but very specific activities where we bring together security forces and the young people to do something normal and everyday activity. Uh, but this is extremely uh, useful in cases or uh, situation contexts where there normally has been a lot of distrust, but where we see that there's a match, a soccer match being played between the security forces and the youth or they're playing together. Uh, this has been extremely positive. And in the end, after this, sometimes the young people have gone to the uh, defense forces camps and have helped, offered to help uh, clean up or do other uh, tasks. So this has been very useful. There are other approaches. Uh, we can look at cultural events where people put on little skits uh, and they might, for example, uh, play the role of police officers and show how they perceive them. And they do it in a sort of fun, lighthearted way, but this way, uh, we can see sometimes the police officers or the security forces see what the perception actually is. And uh, for the community, it, it was just an extremely uh, important way to show how we can have a better relationship. And so this was something that we are doing through cultural activities. And then there's also environmental activities. We've had several cases where we brought the security forces in to help clear up the uh, clear the forests or uh, clean up uh, fields or, uh, or or help dig canals or ditches canals or ditches I mean and so these are activities where we're uh, bringing the security forces together to work with the youth on an environmental project and we see that uh, for example in one commune where there were a lot of issues between the uh, security forces and the uh, youth and after we organized some of these cultural activities, we saw that there was a lot more rapprochement. They came together. And uh, because before, young people, when they saw a police officer coming up, they would run because they thought they were, they were going to be arrested. But now uh, they thought they'd be, they'd be chasing, but they might be uh, smoking something. And uh, they, would, they would run because they thought the police officers were going to arrest them. But now we see that there's better collaboration. Uh, between them because they've had these opportunities to come together. And then in this particular case of this commune or in this neighborhood, and we saw this in our follow-up assessment with the security forces that there was a better uh, perception, but also there was less uh, crime after because we saw the crime rates falling. And so we can see that the collaboration is continuing. Oh, I, uh, you can perhaps give some other examples later. Yes, we can talk about it more during the Q&A. I have a lot of other examples I can share. No, no, but this is quite valuable. Uh, you know, I've been taking note because these are so many examples, concrete examples of how this can, can, uh, can be implemented. And in particular, you know, building this rapport and trust between law enforcement uh, and the youth. Uh, Kimi, let me uh, end with you uh, by asking you this, uh, you know, uh, this final question. Uh, basically, it's the same question, but from a women's role point of view. So how can the effectiveness of law enforcement engagement with women be increased uh, on uh, PCVE? Over to you. Yeah, I'll say establishment of honest, open, and informed dialogues on sensitive issues that um, are of mutual concern to the law enforcement personnel and to the women or the women's group or associations. Um, so that, I mean, they could address issues relating to countering violent extremism, hate, hate crime, propaganda, whatever it is, you know. Um, and there are examples, you know, like I would always emphasize, I would always go back on the patriarchy um, 
issue. So in some, we walk more in the northern part of the country. And we know that there's a mix of patriarchy and religion in the northern part of the country. Um, so you have across the country what we call police community relations committee, which is supposed to be open to everybody, you know. Um, in the northern part of the country, yes, even when you have women um, being members of the PCRC, hardly do you um, find them in meetings. I mean, my time as a team lead for NPP, um, getting into Bornu for a meeting with the CP at that time and um, members of the Eminent Persons Forum, which is supposed to be like a think tank of influencers within the state. I was shocked that I was the only woman in a room filled with over 50 something men. And I had to ask them, are you telling me in the entire Bornu state, there is no woman that can fit this criteria that can also be a member of the Eminent Persons Forum. They laughed it off. You know, the second time, second or third time I came for a meeting was the same thing. So I, I, I mean, I had to take it up strongly with them. Are you telling me that there is um, the Federation of, of Women Lawyers do not exist in Bonu, such that the chair of the of FIDA could be invited to this meeting? And I was so delighted that by the time we were having the closeouts meeting, of the MPP um, early this year in Bornu, the women's wing of PCRC had evolved, right? Because they also said, they said to me after the meeting, they never tell us when the meetings are going to happen. So it's the meetings that you have notification for that you attend. So they decided to set, set up a women's wing, you know. Um, in the southern part of Bono, they decided, I think, to have a female wing of the CSPs also. Similar thing we saw in Kano um, with the PCRC and with the Community Safety Partnership Forum. In Kano, I think they even went as far as having a women peace and security network, you know, so that they have their own space where they have their meetings. And if it is just one or two persons that get to attend the general meeting where they're having um, interaction with the law enforcement and security agencies, issues that have already been discussed within that the general space can be put on the table. So we say as a rule of thumb, if you're a woman and you get a space at the table, remember you are not represent, you're not only representing yourself, you have a community behind you. And when there is, when you have the opportunity, always go back, dialogue and get input from the members of your community so that you can put it on the table. Um, then we have the, um, um, I mean, lessons learning from the peace building architecture and how the women working in the area of peace building have navigated the space is also something we can look at, you know. So predominantly mediators, peace builders, addressing issues relating to sexual gender-based violence. Some of these issues are similar to the issues that we're looking at in the PCBE um, space. So we can build on lessons learned from them then um, platforms for information sharing and exchange. And I find that, I mean, when we talk about platforms for information sharing and exchange, what we are, mobile phones have become a wonderful viable platform. The WhatsApp platform to be precise, you know. So you find, I mean, back here we have I'm a member of different platforms. So part of the feminist um, group in Nigeria. So we have a feminist, we have a platform on WhatsApp, we have on Telegram, you know, that allows us to share information, allows us to um, even exchange ideas when issues, are, when issues come up. It also allows us to quickly mobilize resources because at times resources do not really mean um, money. It could also be technical capacity and availability to push an issue. Um, beyond the feminist platform, um, we also have a platform we call gender updates that we allow for the gender updates. There are men that are part of the 
gender updates um, platform. So it's so you have the men that are he for she advocates that believe in the uh, in the pos in in creating space for women to engage that are also members of these um, platforms. So some for some of the platforms you have security and law enforcement agencies being openly members of the platform, and for some of them they are covertly members of the platform. So maybe one or two you would identify them, but you know um, they might not disclose their identity on the on within the whatsapp group then um recently we passed we just recently got a new police act in nigeria uh the police act 2020 which i which i would say is a gender friendly police act the reason i say that is because it has a clause that says that the nigerian police force is an equal opportunity um, organization and also looks out for the interest, um, gender responsive, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we have the gender policy in country. If this, we, with the gender policy, the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, the police acts, you know, are put together, three of them are used as examples, put together with the National Action Plan on Preventing and Countering Violence Extremism, I'm sure we should be able to develop a concrete, tangible roadmap that would integrate women and other groups in discussion and addressing the issues of preventing and countering violence extremism from the community policing um, perspective. Since that's the new, that's the bingo, that's the way to go. Um, finally, finally, is gender sensitization. I don't think we can do too much of that. Um, recently, when we conducted the gender assessment of the security and law enforcement institutions in Nigeria, the, we found that the knowledge of the UN Resolution 1325 is so limited um, within the leadership of the agencies and even within the operational uh, middle cadre before you can now talk of the junior officers. So having a continuous way of sensitization and bringing it to the front burner of the principles and the ethos of the UN Resolution 1325, which is also part of the, um, I would also link it to the Maputo Protocol because we are Africans and that's the African um, um, platform for it. And the scorecard, you know, um, that has been developed by the AU um, gender unit for assessing member states, you know. So we have it at the forefront that we need to measure up and there's a benchmark for us to engage and for us to live up to. I think these are some of the examples that we can, um, I can put on the table.